What's going on with everybody, man? Back once again with another story to tell. You know I'm eventually running out of stories, man. I'm going to have to just stick to music after this because, you know. But I had a lot of ideas that I was going to bring up that to continue with this uh, with this platform. That way I give everybody a, a general understanding, a more in-depth understanding. One of the biggest topics that I'm going to do is about um, the 14 bonds and how they're manipulating how they're good, but that they, they're used for manipulation tactics as well. I want to show you guys how I was taught throughout the years how to utilize the books like 48 Laws of Power, 33 Strategies of War, 48 Laws of Human Nature. How we were taught to, to look at other people and how we can utilize them for our benefits. But today, today's story is about the, the one and only, the great local man from Merced, you know, Gunner Collect is big homie, as there, as everybody's been commenting and telling me. So I didn't see it like that, but everybody else is like, oh, that's Gunner's big homie. I'm like, oh, little do you guys know. Now, first and foremost, I had to go through a lot of my paperwork to to find it. When I when I sell extracted in the in the hole for not for not uh, cooperating with the IGI, they they tore my cell up. They did a lot. So I lost a lot of paperwork during that process but once i hit the uh, sny you know the cops are really not that that severe and fierce when it comes to like tactics unless you oppress i mean like unless you target them so i managed to save a lot of my paperwork a lot of it all my removals weapons cell phone write-ups uh every battery i did on behalf of the movement i still got all my pictures when i was active with the compas dude i got pictures of all my victims so i want to start introducing it to you guys because uh in the beginning when i first got out you gotta remember i did 15 years straight not in and out but straight i didn't know how to adapt to society and uh mental health already had gave me ptsd so i had to undergo that for like the first year and that's a story from another another time the things that i had to go to my adjustment periods and um so one thing I did to keep me occupied until I was able to, you know, get my California ID, get my social security, get my driver's license, start work employment, is that I got I grabbed a computer and I started typing. I because I felt like everything was just I was still living in prison in my head. I was all I was thought of, all I was thinking about was things about prison, everything that I'd done. Because reality didn't set in that I was free yet. My mind was still in jail. So I told myself, I'm just going to get it off my chest. Everything that I've been through. What it was like for me. That way I can finally start fresh with a fresh mind. And I know to some people it kind of sounds strange. But to me, it worked. Because I couldn't sleep. PTSD was kicking in. I was having muscle spasms. Couldn't sleep for nothing. So I saw, I decided I would be up all day and all night just typing on this computer trying to jot down every memory that I had. And honestly, and I wasn't done, but this is everything typed up. Everything. Everything that I've been through from working to the streets, working for the big homies. I mean, I got pictures of the indictments. Um, from start to bottom, from when I started gangbanging up until I left Tehachapi. And so that's a lot of information over the years, and I'm still not even done. I still got to type, you know, all this up. This is all about, like, Scrappy and everybody. <clears throat> Wasn't thinking about publishing it because um, I didn't want to be, I don't want to be looked at like, you know, like both boxers and, you know, Robert Grattan and I, like, I was just exposing. It was just something that I needed to do so I can finally free my mind from being so isolated and institutionalized where I could just say, you know what? Okay, cool. I got it out the way. So now it's time to focus on, you know, growth, you know, expansion, you know, advancement out here. The betterment of myself now. <clears throat> but somehow, some way, I'm trying to figure it out now that this YouTube is going up and I'm getting a lot of supporters and a lot of people want to hear my story. And I'm thankful for that. And um, I'm trying to figure out a way to, to give you guys all this without publishing it. Maybe I might publish it and then. You know, you guys can read it yourself and you guys can see all the pictures that I have. I mean, I got pictures, you know, on the active side. You know, when I was in, uh, you know, I, I've been through a lot, bro. I just, just know I've been through a lot. So, 
With that being said, I did find the write-up for Local Man. And I'll read it to you guys and then tell you guys what took place. This write-up happened in um, 7 18, 2013. I was on D-Yard. It says battery on the inmate. It says on Thursday, July 18, 2013, at approximately 15.02 hours, I was working D-Yard, s and &E, and standing in front of Building 5 when I observed inmate's Trejo, which was a... Uh, Grimy from Vallejo, compa. Trevino, John Trevino, maniac from Visa. Magana, which was the homie Hazel Eyes from, um, he was from Eastside Fresno Bulldogs. Revis. Who was Revis? No, I think about it. Not even sure. <laughs> but, uh, and then myself. Oh, Revis was my celly. I didn't know about it. I didn't know, I didn't know that was the last name. <laughs> and, uh, Rivera. Everybody knows that local man's name is Rivera. Look, he got a P number. And um, it said all inmates were throwing their arms in a punchy motion towards inmate Rivera's face and upper body as it appeared Rivera was trying to duck and move away from the assault. I immediately called on the radio. Delta Yard is down and began to move forward towards the incident. As I approached the scene, all inmates on the yard began to prone out on the ground, but the fighting continued until I was within 10 to 12 feet, at which time all the suspects and victims got down as well. And then we were escorted in handcuffs off the yard. And then that's pretty much the basis, the, 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 the gyps of it. So let's get into the story now. Now, look, I, I, look to be honest with you, I worked for a lot of big homies at the time on the main line. This guy's name never came up. You'll, when you, even there's a lot of NF members that you'll never hear of because they're, they're just low in rank and file. And a lot of them are just grunts. The C payroll is always going to be the NF brass. Those are the individuals that we pay and Corcoran shoe as well. So this guy's name never came up. So I didn't know nothing about this dude other than what they were telling me on the yard. So what took place was I got to, I got to inform you on some other details. Uh, John Trevino, my boy Maniac, was already getting into it with Local Man. Now, before I knew the actual story of why they were feuding, I was already having a problem with Local Man because I told the homies, of like, bro, if he's an ex and that member, then that means he went through the TH suit. We need to find that out if he did. Because if he did, he debriefed. And he told on a lot of individuals to come on this side. And, you know, we don't tolerate that. So I don't even know who embraced him. But I was already, when I got there, he was already embraced. So the homies are like, all right, we're going to hit him up. The only problem is he was in one block. One block was pretty much like an EOP building for like people that took medication and hot meds. So they couldn't come outside a lot because of the hot meds. So it was hard to run into this individual. Very hard. And um, so I told the homies like, bro, if, we're, if, if our screening process and our embracement process has to do with uh, checking paperwork to make sure dudes didn't testify, that dudes came over here, that they didn't have to uh, debrief. To become part of this movement, bro, we got to look into this individual because there's no way in hell he's an ex and member did not tell. So the homies were like, all right, let's look into it. Because at that time, due to a lot of Snoop's mistakes and a lot of Scrappy's mistakes too as well, they were embracing people through favoritism. Like if they knew you from the same hood, they knew you from the or they felt like you had a heart, like you belong here, they would skip a lot of the procedures and it used to bother me a lot. And it used to bother a lot of us a lot. It's like, bro, nobody's different from anybody else, bro. Like, we're all equal. You know, favoritism was kicking in harder. Snoop had a lot to do with that. A lot to do with that. And here's why. Um, so as I'm already looking into this individual, we started hearing that this individual was punking people and extorting people for their, their medication meds, like their morphine pills. There was even a guy in his building that was in a wheelchair who used to get methadone. And he would escort him to his cell, holding the back of his wheelchair, and make him spit it out, his mouth, on the stool. And he would scrape it and either get high with it or sell it. And then he had a nerve to say that, uh, that he was doing it to further the homies financially, that he was trying to build a, a, a store. But none, we weren't seeing none of that profits for one. For two, we were, we were basically telling him, like, no, bro, you're not going to punk nobody. I don't care for, if it's for a soup, for meds, nothing, bro. And especially if you're a man that's in a wheelchair who's kicking heroin and he's on methadone. Like, that's not cool, bro. We don't do that. And he was not, it was not getting through his head. So he was already 
creating a lot of infractions for himself and we were already building the case for him so that being said now i was waiting to confront this individual like either bro you either stop with your little nf tactics or we're gonna knock you down bro plain and simple but like i said he was hard to get a hold of now why him and the homie maniac were beefing there was an individual who used to be on dr that came from Kern Valley where Snoop was at, named Love. Love was from SAC. And I mean, like, this fool Love, like, he was light-skinned, plucked his eyebrows like a girl. He even had girl tattoos on patterns on him. He had, like, leopard print designs on his face. Like, the boy was feminine as hell. And for some reason, his stilo, that boy influenced a lot of individuals to, to follow that kind of stilo. So a lot of homies, like, they were too full of themselves they did their hair dress nice plucked their eyebrows and even even the homie maniac was doing it at times and i used to be like bro what's up with that dude like we're men bro like chill that shit out bro that's like for the trainees bro you guys are going too far with that but they thought that it was just style was swag that we were different from everybody else i was like no y'all different from everybody else y'all different from us bro we don't do that shit but that was their own little thing that's why if you ever read snoop's book basic fundamentals of the game he talks about Hollywood extras that these dudes were going around the yard wearing a lot of makeup. Love was the start of that. Love had them all doing that. But Love used to call himself Snoop's son. And um, a lot of people in prison used to always, if they're not related to Snoop, they were sellies with Snoop. If they weren't sellies with Snoop, they were like his sons or his cousins or whatever. And Snoop used to say that Love was his son. But in reality, that was never his son. His son actually killed himself and knew Folsom, hung himself because he was gay. And the compas were bullying him at the time and talked him into doing it, which was an unfortunate circumstance, which I don't think that should be done to anybody. And, you know, Snoop did let that go too. So, hey, so this dude was calling himself Snoop's son. So he used to, for some reason, that's what he used to gain a lot of respect and, and uh, you know influence from the people because a lot of people in the beginning of the movement if you had any ties to snoop you became the influential member you used to be able to use his name and use his voice to gain whatever you want out of it and people followed that when i showed up it was around a time that we were already getting fed up with the same dudes talking about the same individual you know just riding his coattail and just doing it for their own selfish gains bro we started seeing the favoritism going on well, love, I guess, so when it took place in High Desert, there was paperwork circulating that he got into a fist fight with another compadre over a misunderstanding on the yard. And in order for love to leave, he ate 12 that homie. So that homie stood out in High Desert and love managed to go to a different facility than land on the yard. Maniac seen the paperwork because at the time, Somehow, some way, a uh, local man got a hold of it, circulated it to tell the combo. I was like, hey, bro, he ate to have another homie. That's a, that's a cowardice move. He has to go. Maniac grabbed that paperwork, flushed it, and didn't tell nobody and made it seem like, man, Maniac, uh, local man was hiding the paperwork or local man is making up the paperwork that this paperwork don't exist. So we kept telling local man, like, hey, bro, until you produce the paperwork and we all see it, bro, we don't know if it exists. The issue died for like four months while local man was trying to figure out where to get this paperwork from. And, um, well, one day, remember the individual that at the time I told you I got the, we found out that he was on the yard and I had the cops pop the door so we can all go outside. Well, local man was playing handball and all of us came out four deep and uh, we approached him. Because he had just shot a kite to Maniac saying that he was calling him a silly rabbit, that he's going to stab him, he's going to kill him on the yard, that he's an NF member, he's killed people before. And I'm, not ready. I'm reading the kite like, bro, you ain't finna touch no homeboy, bro. We don't, we don't touch made members. Without permission, you can't touch one, each other. It has to be approved first. At that, bro, you're doing it on unjustifiable facts that at the time I didn't even know had been justified prior. But that's where Maniac paid the price later on down the road for his stupidity for favoritism love a dude that plucks his eyebrows worse than his girl does and they wind up fighting each other because love had a girl from sacramento and maniac pulled her 
And then him and Love started fighting on the yard and kind of caused a division on D-Yard anyways amongst each other because they all had their own little followers. You know, it takes place. Favoritism takes place during this movement a lot, bro. <clears throat> so anyways, I go out there and I have the kite in my hand and I'm telling local man like, hey, bro, will you get off threatening another homie's life? And he goes, and then he seen that we surrounded him. He's like, wow, what's going on? I was like, bro, you're not going to stab no homeboy, period. You'll never pick up a weapon towards any made man at all, period. You, What's going on? What, what seems to be the problem with this paperwork? Why is it missing? And the, the him and Maniac started yelling at each other. He's like, no, nah, Maniac, you flushed it. I know you did. And Maniac's like, nah, bro, you're accusing me of wrongdoings. You can't be speaking on another comp unless you have facts. And they would go at it for a long time. And then my Sally Playboy at the time from SAC, which is now I remember as, as Rivas, we're just looking at each other, and I was like, bro, I'm tired of talking about that situation, bro. Until there's some, somebody produces evidence on it, I don't really care. Love ain't here. So we're not going to sit here and bicker and argue over something that just doesn't even matter right now. So I showed, I showed local man uh, the one time, and I was like, look, bro, you, I don't care what, what's going on between you two. At the end of the day, you don't threaten another man's life, period. We are not shedding each other's blood. We do enough fighting as it is that you're not going to touch another homeboy for any inconvenience or for your own personal reasons without the committee's decision. And when as I'm holding the kite like this, he reaches and he snatches it out of my hand. He goes, man, I don't fuck that kite, man. I know what I fuck I said, man, and I stand by what I said. And I looked at my home. I looked at my son like in awe. Like, this fool just took the kite out of my hand. Like, this disrespectful ass. And then that was it. That's all he, that's all he had to say. All he, and then after that, he goes, look, man, if y'all going to jump me, I'm like, I'll take, I can take all five of you guys on. And I go, fuck it, fine with me. And I hit him once. And when I hit him once, this eyebrow, like, split open. And he falls. And when he falls, Grimy gets on top. Hazel gets on top. My, my celly kicks him in the face. And I'm just kind of looking around like, man, I can't get no punch in. And so he looks like a little barrel. He's rolling. And then he stands up. And then we start punching him in his head. And then he falls back down. I think we, I don't think we knock him down. I think he falls down because he's trying to avoid the punches. And he starts rolling again. And now we're starting to kick him and punch him. And he starts pedaling backwards. He, he gets back up and he starts running backwards. And then I'm not sure if it was me or Marcelli, but we kicked him in his knee and his kneecap. And I think it broke because uh, he fell. And then I got on top. I punched him a few times. And then I realized, like, oh, he's bleeding everywhere. So we had blood all over our, our, our shirts. So the cops come and, you know, getting sprayed and getting bombed ain't cool, man. That's Especially when that spray runs down your balls and... You're just itching all night because it's burning and nah. Blah, 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 blah. Or when you take a shower and it runs down the back of your ass, this is not fun. It's not a fun thing. So anyways, we go to the hall. And a week later, when we go to committee, I'm the only one that does an eight-month shoe term. Everybody else gets kicked out a week later because there was too many people going to the hall at the time. And, uh, and I was like, what the hell? So I told Maniac, hey, do me a favor. Will, can you collect all my money? And uh, we'll go from there, bro. Just, just send all my money to to my ex at the time. And uh, it's all good. I'll see you guys in a few months. Because I already had did like two two, two or three batteries. And I had a couple fights on the yard. A couple one-on-ones. So they all go back. And local man's in there. And then local man, I see local man going to the yard a lot. And then he, he's always telling me, he's like, hey, hey nah, I ain't going to say nothing, bro. And I was like, all right, we'll see what's up. He goes, hey, but I want to come back. And just like, and you know, even though Snoop's on the other platform saying that there's no such thing as re-embracements and once you get pushed back, ain't no coming back. That's a lie, bro. It's a, it's a fabrication. So many people were during that time were getting, were stepping back and re getting re-embraced through his approval, through other people's use of his name for influence. I'm a pushback. I got rushed and he approved me to come back and I got paperwork right here. Indicating a mission that I had to do to clear up my name because they pushed me back on some false shit But because it was a committee decision at the time the only way to get it reversed was through him So don't let them lie to you guys, bro. It's just I'm gonna tell the truth how, how it is how it needs to be told so Like I said during that time he wants to come back and I go look bro um, As long as you don't say nothing And don't make no statements We'll be good and he actually filled out an alpha David I will respect this man. He filled out an affidavit telling the one, 115 uh, officers and the district attorney because that's the only way I beat my. Uh, I didn't get the case picked up because he, we did create bodily injury on him. 
The DA dismissed it because they said that the, the, the victim wouldn't testify. And in the affidavit, he said, hey, man, they had a right that it was just a one-on-one. -on -one. I hit Escalera first. We started fighting and the rest of everybody was trying to pull us apart because we're actually homeboys in the same movement. They didn't want us fighting no more. These other guys didn't jump me. It was me and him one-on-one -on -one, and I'm old. So maybe I just fell on the grass and I, I messed up my leg. But it was a simple one-on-one -on -one fight. And I don't want to press charges. And sure enough, after I got uh, once I got out the shoe, uh, I got the like the same week I got out of the shoe. The DA shot me the paperwork saying that hey, you know Casey Smith's not gonna pick it up. And I was like, Phew. and this would happen plenty of times afterwards too. So I had to respect him for that, and then local man got transferred. Not sure where because wherever he went, no, I think he went to the I think he went to Lancaster because Snoop actually was trying to bring him back. Years later, like maybe two years later, I came across I came across my desk and I had to shoot a kite. Like, bro, you're you're over here getting mad that a lot of individuals are getting re embraced or stepping back and, and coming back and force backs are coming back and then you're doing the same thing here, but you're telling them not to do it on these other yards, but you're trying to plead a case for local man. And I I can't remember if they they brought him back or not, but I know Snoop was there, local man did plead his case and Snoop was like he 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 was overlooking and he let local man be there when we already had local man on site. Crazy, huh? The hypocrisy. So that's what happened with local man. So I, I I give it to him. He didn't snitch. He stuck up for himself. He stuck up for me because I almost I almost like I said I almost I, I would have faced the DA charge. And right now around that time after like 2014, they're picking up everything. If you have a razor blade taped on the wall, that was a weapon tree. So he did help with my case. And the thing what happened with Love is Love is just MIA now. No, he is nowhere to be found. He sure the hell ain't saying he's Snoop's son anymore. And uh, Maniac, Maniac wind up going into a level three, unfortunately. And with his little feminine ways, he became gay because, and then it all came out later. It all came out later. And this is embarrassing to say, but, and that was my boy from the streets. That was my boy in the pen, but it's hard to say, but him and Love, were actually sailed up on a level three after all this drama, after them fighting over that girl. And then the, the rumor has it that they were just, they were lovers. And I was like, no way. Like, I don't I don't have verifiable proof on that. It's just, it came from individuals who were on that yard, who caught a battery and got transferred to the level foes from this level three. And we're saying it like, hey, bro, they were sailed up. And we pretty much know that they ain't pushing the movement no more, that they just doing their own thing and they were lovers. And I was like, oh, crazy what an embarrassment and that's that's one of the dudes that kind of brought me into this movement he taught me right in the beginning but he shouldn't have held and teach me that shit so yeah here's the write-up but the thing with local man is when a guy went to the da they didn't provide the pictures of his wounds they only gave me what i have from the 115 a lot of times when the it's just a simple battery or if you subpoena the paperwork you can get it and a lot of times uh Sometimes even the even the, even the, like at Tehachapi, they'll just give you the pictures. They don't really care. Most of the time, the pictures have to go to the DA. So sometimes I get pictures of the, my victims, and sometimes I don't. So, but that's the write up. That's the story. To this day, I don't know where he's at. I don't know if he's part of this movement or not. And I know he humbled himself after that because all that preaching that he used to be NF that don't happen no more. And I don't think he was doing that in front of Snoop and Lancaster. But there's a lot of, I'm showing you the, the reason why I elaborate on a lot of the flaws and the errors in our movement, because I know a lot of my people are still watching and they need to understand the true nature of this movement, not the one that's being told and fabricated for his own personal use and his own personal image. No, you need to understand the truth so you can either continue to embrace this movement and the beauty in it. Or you can make that decision and say, you know what, fuck you, I'm going to live your own, you're going to live your own life, man. It's your, it's your decision as a man, but I'll be down if I'm going to let some people just, just make it seem like we're just perfect when I know we're not. But on the same token, there's a lot of things that could be taught that I can do videos of to encourage those of like still believe in this, but believe in it for your own means, for the reasons why you joined this movement, not for reasons well, what this dude's turning it into for his own hidden agenda. We all have our own agenda in this movement. We all take part in our own ways. We all are partakers into this movement. We just gotta find how we can benefit from it and what we can do to benefit it individually and as a whole, but not for somebody else. 
with that being said, man, I hope you guys like that story. You know, I wish I had the pictures of this dude, but dude was an old man, bro. So it's all good, man. Send my love.